Here with me tonight, I have Christine Dennison, who plans and runs expeditions like that of the Titan, Tim Taylor, an expert in deep water searches. We also have underwater forensic expert, Rhonda Moniz. Um, so, uh, Tim and Christine, um, James Cameron, famous director, obviously, of the epic Titan film, a uh, Titanic film, says that he knew about the explosion noise yeah. on Sunday, and he started calling his circle, and they started being able to mentally prepare. So it sounds like there were people who knew that that was a bad sign. And do you have questions about why the search, with all of these resources and manpower and energy and money, went on for so many days? I, I'll tell you one thing. Uh, uh, talking to engineers that have seen this this machine, this, this submersible, um, they utilize, my understanding, uh, a glass sphere in the aft compartment for uh, electronics and for equipment. And the glass sphere is, is, is a really good um, tool for keeping, keeping these electronics in place, but it's, it's full of air and it can implode. It's a, basically a bomb sitting on the back of their, their housing. No ROV, no, no submarine group uses them in their Wouldn't submarines. And, and I'll, I'll take, it one step, take it one step further. No submarine will go near, some submersible operator will go near, they're used in all sorts of beacons and buoys in, in the ocean that are unmanned. Because yeah. if they blow up, it's unmanned. But no operator of a submersible will go near an, uh, a sphere in one of an, an unmanned equipment to do work on it. They won't go near it because if it blows up, it's like it's, it's a small bomb. So that's that will what you think happened. Take, well, well, when you're talking about the Navy sound, if they can't determine what it is, was it the sphere that blew? Are they still intact? Or did the sphere blow oh. and blow up and, and damage their housing and that's what caused them to blow? Or did they just implode on the main housing? So. There's, there's, there's a forensic study which your next or your other guests might might be able to weigh in on that. Got it. But there was they they this design. They couldn't be sure exactly what the explosion sound was. Right. And this this design they use that no one else uses that and it's, it's man submersible. It's another thing that they use in, in, along with carbon fiber that was what they thought was cutting edge and may have been what uh, did them in. I mean now we're hearing about so many people who raise secure um, safety questions mm -hmm. about the manufacturing of this Titan. What are your questions tonight? Christine? Well I think I saw the interview with James Cameron earlier and I think he was just so exact and precise and to hear it coming from an expert like him that has first-hand experience it, it's very valuable and it's very telling that within it, the community, which is a very small community, there have been issues. There have been a lot of red flags for years that this was an experimental sub, that passengers should not have been uh, exposed to it going on this, and that it was a catastrophe waiting to happen, which unfortunately it has. And, mm -hmm. and now our efforts really are, are not just on the recovery, but we've got families. And we have so much information that we really have to delve into and the questions that we all have from, from the first day, the, the, the timing. We've heard so many different stories. I've had so many different sources tell me that they heard there was a distress call, that there was a final ping and, and the timing wasn't right. And, and now we're hearing about the Navy. And transparency at this point where we can't help them, I mean, it's, it's kind yeah. of done, is what we need to do and answer questions for the sake of the families because yeah. they are just in tremendous pain. Understood. Um, Rhonda, you're often called in to consult on these underwater forensic investigations. So where would you start with this one? Well, I think I would start exactly where they're starting and with what they're doing currently. So they've got two sites here, debris sites, that they're going to have to map. They're going to have to use sonar, which uses acoustic waves and gets really very detailed 3D mapping of those areas. As I understand, there's two sites, there's a larger site and a smaller site. They'll map those and then they'll recover the, the debris that they can, anything that's large enough um, that they can recover, they will. So the first, the first thing they have to do is map this site and collect as much data as possible um, and, and mapping it is, is the way to do it. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very detailed. And that'll give them information in addition to what they can salvage yeah. to put this investigation together. Um, and Rhonda, you went on a previous expedition, as I understand it, with Ocean Gate, this company, and Stockton Rush, who is now one of the deceased, but who was the CEO behind um, Ocean Gate. So what were your impressions? I mean, there are so many questions now about whether corners were cut, et cetera. What were your impressions? 
Well, I went on a different um, expedition. It was a different, it was an earlier version of their sub called Cyclops. And it was on the Andrea Doria wreck, which is 250 feet. Of course, it's a vast difference between 12,500 feet and 250 feet. And my job there was as the ROV pilot and I brought redundant systems and redundant parts. And um, my job was in case something happened with that system, I could put ROVs in the water and assist in a, a search and rescue operation. So that was a much different project. And I felt that there were a lot of redundancy. There was a lot of redundancy in that. There was a plan in case something happened. In this situation, it's it's much much different. It's it's a different system, and we're talking about a considerably deeper depth. Mm -hmm. um, I want to play something that Stockton Rush said in 2021 about the materials that he was using: that uh, plexiglass, acrylic, and why he felt confident about it. Uh, it's acrylic, plexiglass. Wow. Yeah, and it is. Uh, seven inches thick it weighs about 80 pounds and when we go to the titanic it will squeeze in about three quarters of an inch it just deforms acrylic's great because it squeezes in and before it cracks or fails it starts to, to crackle and so you get a huge warning if it's going to fail so tim and, and christine you heard him there i mean he's yeah. justifying why he's doing something different right. than what the industry does and he's saying you have huge warning before right. it fails Play it, go ahead. Right. Uh, the, 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 his whole premise was the industry doesn't evolve. This industry evolves, but it evolves at a pace that's safe and, and tested. All right, the, the lithium ion batteries, they use them now. 10 years ago, they didn't. Uh, they cost a lot of money, but they have to be certified, they have to be inspected. Uh, it's a self regulating industry, but it hasn't had an accident in 50 years. And, and he was a renegade in here and he was warned and he was he, he, he went out. Not only did he do carbon fiber, he did glass sphere. He now he's doing acrylics, it, it, changing one thing and testing it, but changing everything. And it is is there, there needs to be some responsibility here. We have to go. Do you have any last thoughts, Kristen? No, I, I just that we should uh, keep the families close to our hearts and that we, we get some transparency and that we, we get the forensics to, to find out really what happened and how it took place. Thank you both very much. Rhonda, thank you for your expertise. Really interesting to talk to you this evening. We've got much more on the catastrophic implosion of the Titan submersible and the five people on board. Next, the tragic history of the Titanic and why it still fascinates us 111 years later. Hear what James Cameron says about the eerie parallels between the Titan sub and the Titanic.